Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you day 297 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As usual, with Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, a Russian opposition politician. On today's stream, more news from the front, Putin's visit to Russian general command offices, not in Ukraine, in Moscow. Prolonged war is not interesting for anybody. Possibility of a third super effort in Russia after the current 200,000 mobilized will be wasted. Ukrainian defense forces will continue destroying all valuable targets of offenders on their territory. Some flashbacks from the first days of war, and both Ben Hodges and Alexei Rostovich have concerns about the capability of Russia to bring 200,000 mobilized at the same time on the front. Enjoy! Dear viewers, glad to see you all. Dear friends, uh, it is Saturday, December 17th, 4 minutes past 10 in Kiev, uh, oh, 5 minutes past 10 in Moscow, day 297 with Alex Rostovich, our usual stream. We have 115,000 watching us and 23,000 click the like button. Thank you very much for spending your Saturday and Sunday with us. We appreciate your effort to help others uh, see that video, that stream, and uh, sharing that link and clicking the like button and subscribing to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and of course to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English language. Apologies, today we are en route, so we coming live a little later than usual and we have different connection issues and not our usual backdrops. All right, that happens. Um, Alexei, let's start with the news for the day. Perhaps show the map. All right, are we showing the map? Yes, okay, good. So, here's some. For obvious reasons, there are no ground fighting. But there is a lot of artillery work, and uh, Russian invaders continue shelling the city of Kherson, and there are several citizens, uh, several civilians who died. And uh, they keep attacking not just Kherson, but many other uh, places, and uh, also attacked the electric station, killed a couple of people there. Our side is uh, retaliating with long range artillery rather effectively on uh, forward operating bases, on aggregations of uh, armor and troops. There is not a single day on Kherson direction that we do not hit some significant targets. And for the most part, yeah, we also hitting warehouses and fuel resources. On Zaporozhye, only some tactical motions. Oglidar doesn't have any more effort behind it. Uh, they, they're just some tactical infighting. Everything on the east, that line from Marinka, Avdiivka, Bahmut Solidar, these are all attempts to continue pushing forward, sending a couple of platoons with a bit of copters to record what's happening and observe, trying to move forward, get their asses kicked, fall back, whoever is left. There are parts where it depends upon our line, in some uh, parts of this front line, we're holding the same position for months, in other parts they managed to slowly, slowly push through. And you can see on the map that they take a few yards every day and for the last week and, you know, a hundred yards a week or something like that, but they pay a huge price for that in hundreds and thousands. Ultimately, they continue their attempts to Attack Bakhmut and Solidar. These are the hottest. Between Solidar and Bakhmut, they're also trying to push in between and separate one town from another. They're failing to do that. But they're still, yeah, the fight is still very intensive, rough, and cruel. 
Значит, напоминаю, на восточных окраинах Бахмута. Russian troops are already on the eastern outskirts of Bakhmut, so there are already fights happening on the build and around the buildings on the eastern side. So what happens? They get to the house, they take hold of it and continue trying to maintain that position and bring more troops. Uh, our troops counterattack, usually push them back. Today, by the way, tonight there was uh, such event. They were uh, attacking, taking taking some houses. We pushed back, took some next to them. So it was a lot of street fighting for uh, on the tactical level, where both sides are showing their initiative and it's not one side defending another attacking. There is not a single day there without our small counteroffensive. <coughs> okay, we're going further. Belogorovka is still hot. They continue battering uh, the gates, the, the entrance to that area. And they're just like rams. They, they got an order and they continue bumping into that uh, fortified area. Today you've seen probably some videos, uh, that's actually from Bakhmut side. Oh yeah, we saw there are some dozens of bodies and trenches piled together. Is it because they nobody can remove them? No, we shot the video. We uh, shot them and uh, took their positions and they literally have nobody to evacuate the bodies. So, yeah. Kriminaya, it's about the same story. One line going one way, another going the other. They're trying to push uh, through our defense line and we are finding ways to push through them. They continue attacking our cities. Wherever they cannot reach us with field artillery and places like Nikolaev, Dnieper, Kherson, uh, very often they use S 300s. Kriverok as well. Uh, Kharkov. By the way, I think in Kriverok uh, a family died. Yes, here on the map, uh, center to 7 p.m. Mother, father, and younger brother died, but about a 13 year old kid survived, and that's probably a good candidate for our aid. Yeah, we should bring it up. Uh, we'll talk about that. Our last attempt was still looking for the contacts for... Remember the story with the dead infant? We're still looking for contacts for his mother. All right, from our viewers, if you are in touch with this family, if you are in touch with them somehow, please uh, share contacts. Yeah, we're just... Alexei, sorry to interrupt you. We are trying to be careful with our stipend we you know we cannot fully check it uh, or do anything after we send so every time before we send it to the recipient we need to double and triple verify people are asking if uh, we pause this program we did not we actually have about 10,000 so we can help five uh, recipients and we still need to find proper context we cannot just send it please uh, give this money to so and so we need their direct uh, contact direct bank account okay so yeah dear viewers continue uh, help helping us if you have contact of uh, with these people please uh, share and uh, okay so we continue with the news now that we've touched upon the front they were writing yesterday in Russian media that Putin was working in some joint command of uh, Russian military. They're not clarifying where, and they're talking about the whole 17th of December, him spending and listening to reports of Shoigu, Gerasimov and others. There was some protocol video footage that they presented. Why, why are they showing that? Well, probably because the great leader and uh, general commander of uh, Russian troops is uh, they wanted to make a picture to show that he cares that he indeed looks 
Uh, no, no, no. I mean, why, why are they showing the video? You think he was going to visit Donbass or something? Or he's visiting something in Moscow, or that's their front line now? Mark, no, this is definitely uh, him visiting some locale in Moscow. Usually Joint Command is a central command and uh, yeah, he's visiting, even if it's the protected, covered or something, uh, it's still somewhere near Moscow. Definitely not a, a forward operating anything. This is just an office in the central command. Well, he needs uh, to show that to whom? To army? No, probably for the internal audience. Army, I don't know if they have time to see that, but for the internal audience to show that he indeed cares, that he is uh, monitoring, that he keeps an eye on uh, everything happening relating on the front, and the top leader is uh, definitely caring. That's what they're sending, the message. Uh, it's rather simple, actually. As a person who spent a lot of time on TV, they actually measure social uh, questions with their audiences, and whenever they hear that Oh, Putin hasn't been out too much, uh, hasn't been seen with military, and that's the video they need to make them. You know, modern-day politicians, they are not free people. In full sense of this word, they are very often manipulated by these statistics and the social measuring. So, they got this message, and they recorded the video, and there he is on the media. It looks rather stupid, Alexei. Well, yes, for the intellectuals, it definitely is silly. But common folks from somewhere deep in the country, they don't think in these categories like you do. So I'm just thinking, Alexei, if we see a video of Zelensky meeting Ukrainian general command, that's not even the news, right? He's meeting with them probably daily. Well, yeah, and he's being shown more, more often on the front line and other parts of the front. Yeah, exactly. So. Talking to generals is not even the news. Well, it's different style. He he definitely behaves differently. He's got his own style in communicating with the soldiers and uh, the, uh, the officers. So that's not even the news, right? Exactly, but that's the kind of news they have. Putin met military listened to their reports, held a paper, some sheet of paper in front of camera for 10 seconds, pretended that he can read maps. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just bringing it up because all their life, their Alexei is a pretend play, it's not real. Whatever news you see in Russia, that's just fakery. Stoltenberg, the Secretary of NATO, said that will continue supporting Ukraine in a long-term warfare and will continue providing armor and equipment to Ukraine until Putin figures out that there is no way for him, no chance for him to win this war. I actually have a question to you. I doubt that it is a right supposition to think that Moscow has some benefit of this war turning into uh, an extended warfare. I don't quite understand what does that mean for Russian military-industrial complex, for Russian population, which is not in favor of any long-lasting conflict. So that uh, duration aspect of this war, let's comment on that. Because looking at the words of Stoltenberg, it seems like Moscow wants an extended conflict, and according to this logic, that is not a favorable situation for Ukraine. So do you think extended warfare is not a danger for Russia and a danger for Ukraine? Frankly, prolonged war is dangerous for all. Probably, no, long choice of words. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes uh, prolonged wars. Again, what is prolonged? It's a year, year and a half, or more than a year, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be more than a year and two months, right? And we understand that in two months the war will not be over. And I also have a strong suspicion that after a year it will not be complete in another half a year. So, 
<clears throat> that'll be probably another six months. And the Western politicians are not uh, just as uh, dependent of, on the public opinion as the Eastern. So Stoltenberg is reacting. Why, by the way, why are they inserting the verbiage uh, negotiations into almost every statement? Because there is a group of electors and uh, voters in the West brainwashed to a degree who want to have a chance to talk to Putin. So Western politicians basically are throwing them a bone. And you'll see very often when they're making a big speech on the topic, uh, they'll throw something to the right saying, yes, we'll continue this war and we'll fight. And then something to the center. We are developing our industrial capacities. We're figuring out how to increase jobs and uh, do something on our internal econ economic issues. As we do that, they do not suffer. And then they throw a bone to the left side and saying, of course, of course, we are also concentrated on negotiating. So I agree, Alexei, it kind of looks like a common phrase that's being used everywhere. Uh, somewhat, Mark. It is basically an attempt to indicate to your voters that you do care about their opinion. And some of them do care about negotiations. Speaking of prolonged war, let's see who can suffer that, who can fare that easier. 1.5% of world economy or 60 plus percent of world economy. Well, that's obvious, right? That's obvious. The day before yesterday here, I said that, you know, I don't quite believe uh, in a third super effort on the Russian side to aggregate another 200,000. And then I gave it a thought. I'm also, I was contemplating for the last couple of days thinking, okay, maybe, maybe they can gather 200,000. Um, but then also I'm all concerned about their capability to throw the current 200,000 all at once on the front. Perhaps physically they are available, right? Um, again, some questions related to that, but still, imagine they have them. They don't have enough equipment. But again, still, let's imagine that they somehow gathered the equipment and weapons and threw them into the fight and they all died or got wounded. And then a few months later, they need to gather another 200,000. So they are again facing the same dilemma. They need weapons, they need clothes, they need supplies. What else can they do? Can buy, maybe buy another set of Iranian shahids and maybe some of the missiles. But there are no strategic moves for Russia in this situation to ultimately change the flow of the war, to win. So I understand Russian side may be expecting that the West will say, well, we are tired of uh, supporting Ukraine for that long, let's sit down and negotiate. Maybe they're relying on that uh, possible eventuality, but it's rather impossible to think about it. And even uh, Mikhail Padalyak actually came out today and said, we are not even discussing anything with leaving Crimea and other territories to Russia, even temporarily. So not an option. That is why I'm thinking this war will likely start dropping in the intensity. The intensity of airstrikes is already decreasing and will continue to be continue to decrease further. Intensity of fighting on the ground will get lower, and it, of course, should be finished by Ukrainian defense, force, defense forces on the front. And it depends directly upon the supplies of armor, artillery, and uh, armored vehicles, artillery and tanks from the West to our fighters. I have a feeling similar to intuition, I guess, that says that maybe at some point we'll get jets as well, not just air defense systems. And if that continues going for a while, perhaps more new nomenclature on the ground, because uh, NATO countries, they do take some time to rev up their industrial production. And in the meantime, Russia would be trying to buy Korean pants and Iranian, buy Iranian uh, rifles. Well, the Ukrainian army will be becoming stronger and technologically more advanced. We already are more advanced. Perhaps by that time, Ukrainian army will be able to use uh, JDAM bombs, which are 
smart ones and can find uh, operating bases much easier than many other means. And by the way, Brits recently mentioned that they can equip our usual free-falling bombs uh, that will turn them into a very well-targeting weapon that uh, will have an error of 10 meters. So, yeah, if a huge bomb drops within a 10 meter vicinity from the target, uh, target is gone and that bomb is stronger than HIMARS uh, to a degree. So, everything will be revving up on the Ukrainian side and uh, slowing down on the Russian. The question is, uh, of course, the tempo. We would want, of course, we would appreciate to continue getting these supplies from the West at a higher tempo that would allow us to overcome Russia. Basically, whenever our intel services tell us that Russian troops are aggregating at a certain part, the certain area of the map, we need to be able to transport our troops effectively, quickly to that area and to provide a certain either prepare, pre either prepare the front or to attack Russian troops at their disposition. And um, we're trying to increase such capacity. We, of course, uh, do need more logistics, more weapons, uh, sorry, more trucks, more vehicles uh, delivering uh, different supplies to the front, and, of course, armored vehicles themselves, tanks and artillery. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Okay, we're at about 290,000 watching us, about uh, 100 of you, 100,000 click like button. So there was an interesting news, I'm reading again, that Ukrainian military supposedly organized attack on Gerasimov. What? Well, New York Times, New York Times confirmed uh, that uh, article saying that Ukraine indeed was targeting the head of Russian command, Gerasimov, when he visited the front, and America was against uh, painting him as a target and against that attack, and actually even requested Ukraine to not attack uh, the general, and in return they heard that attack has already commenced. Well, Mark, with all respect to New York Times, I can say that usually military forces of Ukraine do not ask permission to shoot. We shoot if we see the target. So, Americans mentioned here in the article that they knew where he was and didn't exchange, didn't share that information with Ukraine. Perhaps, yeah, they perhaps knew about his whereabouts and didn't share that information, but then this article, for the most part, then talks not about Ukraine, but about America and how they behaved knowing that uh, Gerasimov is visiting the front line. And the main point of this article is their decision about sending or not this information to Ukraine, what concerns they had, possible escalation. But, you know, Mark, our military and our political leadership from the very beginning have no sentiments. They have goal, they have target. If we see the target, if we can access them, we will hit them. And we're hitting them very accurately. I, th I think I told you once, there was one visit of one of the high-ranking Russian officers, could have been a Gerasimov actually, when about 50 fighters of their super elite special force detachment died during that visit. And uh, that person himself, that uh, HVT, managed to leave the front, but uh, his uh, protection detail was uh, annihilated. Are you here with us, Alexei? Yes, I am. Seems like you were frozen for a sec, Mark. Sorry, my chat is screaming at me for your microphone. Yeah, I'm pulling the reins now. I'm trying to make sure it doesn't touch the jacket. Okay, I'll open you a serious uh, secret. Gerasimov was in the Zoom at, at one point, and we were hitting Gerasimov. When was it? I'm uh, trying to remember. I think it was second half of April or May, somewhere in spring. 
Oh, that story that uh, he is maybe wounded, right? That story? Exactly. So we shelled the command post where he was uh, visiting, and we destroyed, we killed a lot of uh, their high ranking officers there, but he managed to evacuate, he managed to leave that uh, position just a little bit earlier. So if you knew where he was, would you hit? Mark, we knew where he was and we did. But what if Putin will be in Minsk? Will you reach him there? Mark, Minsk is Belarus. We're not giving Belarus any reason to attack us. And what if Belarus will start the invasion? Well, invasion is a different story then. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll follow the circumstances in this case, but uh, just heads up, Mark, we're not sentimental. If we see targets and we have measures, uh, means to reach them, we do. Destruction of Gerasimov with his uh, high command was part of our goals, was part of our targets, because that would help us to cause a pause on the front, on active Russian actions on the front. At that time, they were very active, so that was definitely part of our intents to hit him when he was visiting. We are not going to attack Belarus. We treat them as a friendly nation that is partly occupied by, occupied by Russian troops and their own dictator. So even if Putin visits uh, Lukashenko in Minsk and just think it through. If we do a missile strike on them, what if we miss Putin, don't kill him, and then some civilians die, and then Lukashenko comes out and says, well, I told you, we need to now join the war and avenge that attack. So what did we reach then? Okay, okay, I understand. But what if the invasion starts? Well, Mark, if invasion starts, then Alagir come Alagir, that's in war like in war. It's just news coming out, uh, like say, that he might be in Minsk on the 19th. Mark, even if they announce that they will be joining or take a, make a decision that they will join the war, on the 19th, if they make it official, it'll take them another couple of months to even join the war. And uh, once again, Putin will never visit any area that we can reach with our equipment. And he's only brave in his bunker. On the front, he will be his pants. If we see, if we find somebody within our reach, we definitely hit, hit them. And, for example, Gerasimov, you didn't, uh, you, you didn't really kill him, right? Well, Mark, we were not sentimental again. We had limitations in our means, how far and where can we reach him. We were tracking him, just for your understanding. We could see his movements, but the problem was we needed to we needed him to be at a place where we can reach him. The moment he did is when we started the operation. So after your attack, he hasn't visited the front, right? No, yeah, exactly. He hasn't been to the front ever since. I think he is afraid. And in that attack, there's probably 20 high-ranking colonels who died in uh, that commanding post. And they're not simple ones. They're the ones from the general command who know how to conduct operations, how to play things out with, uh, on the trainings and the maps and all. It probably takes about 10 years to get to their level of knowledge, or better, 20. Okay, I got your point, Alexei. We're just trying to understand how what, what eventualities are possible. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to ask you, Alexei, what will happen if Putin will come to Lugansk? But what if he will come within reach? Um, we'll, we'll hit him. We'll hit him, and I'm, I think I'm repeating it for the fourth time. If we can reach him, we will hit him immediately. Well, you know, Alexei, then, upon listening to our show, he'll probably listen to that and decide to not come, then why, why, why are you asking? Well, yeah, right, I don't think uh, he's a fool though, I don't think he'll come to the border. Exactly, Mark, then why are we talking about it for the last five minutes? He definitely will not come anywhere where he will become a target. Remember his recent appearance in the hall of uh, one of the Kremlin receptions? He had to get himself drunk to come, come out to public, because I think he was scared shitless. 
Нет, ну просто а, из-за того, что мы вот... А, из-за того, что мы... А, well, since we're discussing all these matters, some details start being revealed more. Oh, you mean in that? Okay. Yeah, let them, let them surface, no big deal. Yeah, you know, he'll probably listen to all that and say, oh, you did want to kill me, and him and Gerasimov, and uh, they'll not visit anywhere close, closer to the front. Mark, Putin will only be appearing in his bunker, because he, he is a, yeah, he's a coward. He's a puny coward. He can only look brave on the cameras, but he was a coward and he'll die a coward. Have we ever seen him on the front? When was the last time when he visited any front? Did he visit the Second Chechen War back in the day? No, I think he maybe visited Mozdok once. Yeah, I, I remember some, vaguely remember a video of something funny in a funny hat visiting probably Mozdok back in the day once. Okay, another news uh, that was from Again, the same New York Times that there was a detailed map of Russian troops attacking Kiev. You mean a new one? Oh, no, 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 that was an old. They are analyzing the spring operation. Okay, so the old invasion. Um, they're saying that according to their sources, according to military deployed in Belarus, learned that they will be deployed into Ukraine an hour before the operation started. And their task was to reach Kiev in 18 hours. 18 hours, Alexei, that's even faster than two to three days. According to the journals uh, of the detachment, their columns were supposed to leave Belarus and arrive to uh, Kiev by 4.55, but the column got delayed and just across the border it took them about a day. And then it got worse from there. They lost hundreds of soldiers and uh, dozens of vehicles and so on and so forth. How does that coincide, correlate with your feelings of, uh, with what you remember about the first days, that motion from the north towards Kiev? Well, what we destroyed in the first two, three days, during those days when we also did a couple uh, videos with you, there were a lot of uh, video materials that I was sent, and I think uh, one of the first videos that I was sent was some joint quick, uh, joint quick reacting task force somewhere near Irpin when they tried to cross the bridge and got shelled and were burning there. For me, it looked like a lot of columns, dozens, hundreds of vehicles, helicopters, uh, targeting, targeting the columns, destroying the front, destroying the end, and then grinding everything else down. My whole phone is full with videos and pictures from those days. I can probably publish some of them after this war is over, but it is difficult to tell which of them were which. Sometimes there were some joint uh, groups, uh, there were a lot of uh, airborne troops, uh, there were a lot of mechanized infantry, all kind of insignias. There were less uh, Z, Z, Zers near Kiev, less Zs, mostly Bs and uh, Os. But um, those joint uh, special fast-reacting police force were there indeed. Um, for some reason, they were considered to be specialists of uh, city warfare, uh, somehow as if they can do it better than airborne troops and storm infantry. But um, the main casualties were suffered by the airborne detachments. Um, police was a little faster, so they came faster to the very front. And while military were dragging behind on the tracks, um, these police units had wheels and wheel bases, so they came sooner. And uh, we were hitting them, we were, deleting, we were destroying them at hundreds uh, per day, so thousands total. Yeah, I, I just think we need to repeat that, because there are some people in Russia who still don't get it. 
that those people who moved on Kiev in February, oh yeah, Mark, yeah, they were, by the way, way more professional. Uh, and again, Alexei, the ones, the new ones that are being trained, perhaps they'll get some experience too, but they'll be burning faster, right? Yeah, I'm reading some notes from those days. We had 17 battalion tactical groups moving towards Kiev. About, I think, 12 of them were. Airborne troop detachments, the rest were joint police, special forces, motorized infantry, and others. I'll probably even show some here. Send them to me so I can post them on my Telegram channel after the show. Hang on, let me, let me show you some pictures. Well, they're complaining that they don't see much on the screen here. I get it, I get it. Uh, some of them cannot see well. That's okay, I'll send you pictures, but... For example, here's some videos. That's a video of a column, destroyed column at the, there by the horizon. It's probably about a thousand units in this one. And uh, that's some of our fighters recording it. They were taking note, sending coordinates, and then the columns were shelled by artillery. That's uh, 28th of February. I'm trying to remember which day when I tried to reach you and you were not, uh, you could not tell me where you were. Mark, I was traveling throughout the area in those days. I was always on, on the road. There's another one burning, for example. We did a lot of good things at that time. I'll uh, send, send everything to me. Okay, this is a good one. Oh, no, that's a refinery. Okay, so this one is near Irpin. See the smoke? That's another column burning. This one decided to go through the forested area when the bridge got blown up, and they, that's what happened to them. There are a lot of episodes like that. I just want to say, viewer, tell viewers that join our Telegram. Those who know that uh, a well-known uh, part of Kiev uh, suburb, that circle thing, so there was another column there that got hit and destroyed. And here's more. There is a ton of pictures and videos here. A lot of good events that they bring to memories. Um, some of uh, great attacks that we did back in the day. For example, here is the refueling um, on Zhitomir uh, Highway. And Kadyrovci were going passing that uh, milestone marker. And that's what happened with them. The first volley hit about 20 vehicles. They tried to go backwards and uh, the 20 in the rear were destroyed. And then our helicopters brought some of the airborne troops from Ukraine side when they tried to hide in the village and they destroyed remaining forces right there in that village. So, yeah, there were so many events like that at the first days of the war that I don't even have time to write them all down. It was good times when uh, we managed to stop them. Well, that's why I'm bringing that. When mobilized will come here, exactly, exactly, Mark, when mobilized will come here, they know nothing. And uh, my message will actually to them, stop it, idiots, stop this uh, idea. See, there's another video, another good one. Yep, everything burning. There are a lot of stories like that. We have 324,000 with us. There's some more armor destroyed. Yeah, a ton, a ton of uh, things. So if anyone wants to come and repeat uh, that service again, please, uh, please come, we'll uh, be obliged. Yeah, Alexei, we told them before the war, they seem to be dumb, they don't listen. We even told them before the war to not do that, and during the war. Okay, another thing, our dear friend, uh, US General Ben Hodges, uh, is expressing concerns about Russia being able to attack Ukraine in February. According to his statement, Russia will not be able to aggregate enough troops for that same for, for the of that quantity of 200,000 to conduct any offensive operation we do not have any reasons to stop support of ukraine ukraine is doing fine so 
Uh, another another interesting episode I want to bring up. I think it was 26th uh, near Baradyanka. We destroyed at least 26 tanks when they tried to move uh, between the airport airport to the glass manufacturing there. And that's when artillery and Su-24s, our jets, worked on them. You know, when you ask me why I was in good mood the first few days of this war, uh, I usually am in a good mood, but uh, when you're calling me, I'm observing the results of our operations. I understand it was difficult times, but uh, there are a lot of successful operations. And, you know, I wasn't everywhere physically. I'm a rather modest person. My job was to talk to people. But speaking of uh, Ben Hodges and his statement, I also have concerns about Russian side to be able to do that. I have no concerns that Russia indeed has reserves, that uh, they will conduct that strike and that offensive. But Ben was talking about 200,000 that uh, all of a sudden will run over our front in February and uh, conduct some super offensive. I have serious concerns about them being able to do that. They maybe have a half of that uh, troop uh, size available for them to do anything, to conduct any operation, and they'll probably try to attack the usual, the Eastern Front, then maybe Kharkov, um, probably Kharkov and Lugansk border towards Svartava, that area, and uh, the South as well. So yeah, citizens of Kharkov don't uh, don't faint. We're not talking about them moving towards Kharkov. We're talking about them using Kharkov to go down to Svatova, that area, too early. So I do support uh, opinion of General Ben Hodges that uh, there will not be a sudden offensive of 200,000 troops immediately showing on the front and doing one operation. So you are of a different opinion than Zaluzhny, right? No, it is uh, media that uh, interpreted Zaluzhny's statement wrong. What he said is that Russia will be capable of aggregating about 200,000 and will in involve them in their fighting and uh, might even use them to attack Kiev. Of course, media perverted that. They decided that, okay, he just said that uh, 200,000 will attack Ukraine and all of them will attack Kiev. Uh, trust me, as a person who is giving a ton of interviews on different media for the last eight years, not a single time any of the legacy media used uh, has used a proper title for the interview. They often and uh, always use uh, some hyped up uh, fakery from our, or uh, something that they managed to convert from that interview that they think will cause more clicks. Uh, more eyeballs on it. And that's what they're always doing. So Zaluzhny, in essence, never said that uh, 200,000 will jump at the front line and uh, conduct some offensive altogether. In general, uh, just like Hodges, I, I'm also of opinion that they will bring these troops gradually as much as they can and probably within two or three months uh, to the front and use them in different locations wherever they will see fit or wherever they will have capability to do that. So that's what we're talking about. All right, so we're finishing the show. We had about 300,000 watching us. Um, about 150 of you clicked the like button. And um, yeah, sorry for the mic uh, distractions today. We are en route. So we don't have our usual microphones and uh, setups. Please uh, forgive us for that. And please continue sharing that stream, clicking the like button. That is the something little you guys can do to help us uh, promote and help us get this message out. And hopefully at uh, the end, uh, affect support Ukraine and save some lives. OK, I think that's it for today. We're good. Uh, these 42 almost minutes are enough. Whatever we didn't uh, finish today, we'll meet on Monday, right? Yes, Mark, Monday is good. Tomorrow is a uh, soccer final. We understand that nobody will be watching anything except that. And uh, you guys, probably there is a number of you who will be watching soccer. And there is a bunch of you who won't. Mark, no, it's just tomorrow I can't. I have my own schedules. So tomorrow I'm not coming for that, not because of soccer. Um, so we'll get back on Monday and talk, talk it up on Monday. Thank you, Alexei. See you Monday. And see you all on Monday.